60 years ago this month, the United States and the Soviet Union stood on the brink of nuclear war. The issue? The installation of missiles in Cuba. The crisis began after an American U-2 spy plane secretly photographed nuclear missile sites built by the Soviet Union on the island. President Kennedy didn't want anyone to know about his discovery. He met in secret with his advisors for several days to discuss the problem, ultimately deciding to place what he called a naval quarantine around the island. The goal was to prevent the Soviets from bringing in more military supplies. He also demanded the removal of the missiles already there and the destruction of the sites. No one was sure how Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev would respond. On October 22, 1962, the president spoke to the nation. This government feels obliged to report this new crisis to you in fullest detail. The characteristic of these new missile sites indicate two distinct types of installations. Several of them include medium-range ballistic missiles capable of carrying a nuclear warhead for a distance of more than 1,000 nautical miles. Each of these missiles, in short, is capable of striking Washington, D.C., the Panama Canal, Cape Canaveral, Mexico City, or any other city in the southeastern part of the United States, in Central America, or in the Caribbean area. Additional sites not yet completed appear to be designed for intermediate range ballistic missiles capable of traveling more than twice as far and thus capable of striking most of the major cities in the Western Hemisphere, ranging as far north as Hudson's Bay, Canada, and as far south as Lima, Peru. In addition, jet bombers capable of carrying nuclear weapons are now being uncrated and assembled in Cuba while the necessary air bases are being prepared. Coming up, President John F. Kennedy's calls, news conferences, and addresses to the nation over the 13 days known as the Cuban Missile Crisis. First, joining us by phone, Barbara Perry, Presidential Studies Director at the University of Virginia's Miller Center. Professor Perry, before we talk about the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis, please describe what came to be known as the Bay of Pigs event in April 1961. The Bay of Pigs event usually has the term fiasco uh, said in the same breath after it as in Bay of Pigs fiasco. And Bay of Pigs was the landing spot for about 1,100 invaders who had been trained by the United States CIA. Uh, These were Cuban nationals who had fled from uh, the communist regime that Fidel Castro had imposed late in the 1950s. And the United States had this bizarre relationship with the invasion in the sense that it had the invasion plans had been started in the Eisenhower administration and then when Kennedy came in, into office in January of 61 uh, he decided to carry forth with the plan with some changes and the changes that he made and the decisions he made almost ensured that it would not be successful and Castro had gotten wind of it His forces were waiting. About a 100 or more of the invaders were killed uh, on the beaches of the Bay of Pigs, and the rest, the rest of the invading force of about a 100, about a 1,000 people then were imprisoned uh, on the island of Cuba. And Jacqueline Kennedy said in her oral history the year after the president's death that uh, during this terrible crisis, when the president realized how badly this was going, she said it was one of only three times in their 10-year marriage that she had ever seen him cry. And one was when he was facing a, a deadly illness after back surgery and the frustration from a bad surgery gone awry when they were first married in the 1950s. And then the last time was when they lost their infant son in August of 1963, just before the president's own death. But Mrs. Kennedy said uh, the president come up to the residence and, and just sort of sat and put his head in his hands and, and wept for what was happening. Now take us to the fall of 1962. Please describe the events that led up to the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, how that played out, and also whether the Bay of Pigs had any part in what happened in 1962. 
It, it doesn't take a rocket scientist, as they say, to think that there is a connection between the two. And sometimes they even called this first Cuba and second Cuba in terms of the crises precipitated during the Kennedy administration uh, in, in the sense that Castro turned to the Soviet Union as a protector. The Soviets then placed missiles in Cuba aimed at the United States and an attempt to prevent another invasion. And yet the United States was bound and determined for years and years to try to remove Castro, even if by assassination, if necessary. Uh, so the missiles being placed in the fall of 1962, leading up to the Cuban Missile Crisis, so-called, uh, definitely was a response to uh, the Bay of Pigs. And the fact that Kennedy met with Khrushchev in the spring of 1961 in Vienna uh, and, and didn't make a very good show of it, uh, Kennedy was perhaps a little bit overconfident going into the meetings, and as he came out, he indicated that uh, Khrushchev had savaged him. Uh, so the combination of Khrushchev seeing Kennedy as weak and inexperienced and very young uh, and the fiasco at the Bay of Pigs, I think all were multiple causations that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis itself. Now, the audio we're about to hear on the Cuban Missile Crisis includes portions of news conferences and President Kennedy's addresses to the nation, both before and following the situation. Please describe for us the reaction of the press and the public to this crisis, and did they support the administration's actions? Well, as we can put ourselves in that position, listening to the president say that 90 miles from the coast of Florida uh, were uh, ballistic missiles aimed at the United States that could hit just about every major city uh, in the United States, including putting Washington, D.C. and the White House at ground zero, uh, absolutely caused a panic uh, through the country, or at least uh, upset, and people wanting to build bomb shelters, stories in the in the press about how to build a bomb shelter, what to include, how to make it, uh, you would hope, nuclear fallout proof, to put food and water in storage. Uh, so people were, were on edge, to say the least. Uh, schools were going through the, the now we call them duck and cover drills. In my school, they called them tornado drills. Uh, but there was just a, a wave of upset. Maybe panic is too strong a word because I think Americans usually are up to the challenge, but certainly upset, anxiety, stress levels very high in the public. Uh, in terms of the press, uh, the press... I think had already been uh, shaken by what happened at the Bay of Pigs, that this was a secret uh, invasion, uh, at least secret to the press at the time, and those who knew about it were asked not to reveal it. So uh, while Kennedy generally had a, a very good relationship with the press, he had been a journalist for a while right after the war before he went into politics. Uh, many friends he had in high places in, in journalism, even through his father's diplomatic career. Uh, he was very good friends, as we know, uh, JFK was with Ben Bradley, with Hugh Sidey uh, of uh, Time Life. And so he, he had good relationships, and, and they wanted to do the right thing. They wanted to be patriotic and not reveal secrets. But the uh, American government and the president, the State Department, the Defense Department, went to the press and said, please, if you know anything about what's happening in Cuba, don't report it right now. Uh, and even if you get it from another source, please don't report it. So through the crisis, the press held firm to the government's wish not to reveal any information that might cause these very delicate negotiations with the Soviets to go awry and cause a, a nuclear conflagration. We'll also hear phone calls between President Kennedy and Secretary of State Dean Rusk, Deputy Defense Secretary Roswell Gilpatrick, and General Lucius Clay. Did the President trust these top advisors and act on their advice? I would say that generally the, the president did trust these three men and most of his advisors because after the Bay of Pigs, he revamped his advising team. Uh, so, for example, he ousted, uh, when his term was up, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Lemnitzer, and replaced him with uh, General Taylor. Uh, he pushed out uh, Alan Dulles, the CIA director, uh, and replaced him with uh, Mr. McCone um, as director of CIA. He created what was called the executive executive committee of the National Security Council, or XCOM as it was called, and most importantly placed his brother, the Attorney General Robert Kennedy, on that committee and brought him into foreign policy advising. And that, that 
move was probably the best thing that he could have done because Bobby was always going to have his brother's back and he was the one person he trusted the most. In terms of these other people, um, Dean Rusk uh, was a a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, He was a bright, bright, mild manner, but tenacious person. Uh, But while he had been the head of the Rockefeller Foundation and and knew his foreign policy, uh, again, according to to Mrs. Kennedy's oral history, the president had some trouble with the fact that Dean Rusk, while he was a a good analyzer and synthesizer of information, he didn't necessarily like to make big strategic decisions. And so she said that the president complained that uh, he would say, I could do more in a day than Dean Rusk could do in six months. (laughs) So while I think he trusted him, uh, he wished that he would make decisions more quickly. Uh, Roswell Gilpatrick, the deputy uh, secretary of defense, was handpicked by JFK uh, to have that role, uh, in part because his secretary of defense, Robert McNamara, while he had been head of the Ford Motor Company and was a brilliant man, uh, had very little uh, military or defense or uh, international relations experience. So he brought in Roswell Gilpatrick uh, to try to help with with that. And then General Lucius Clay um, was a, a special advisor advisor to the president. He was very intelligent. Uh, The president knew that he had been in charge of uh, Germany after the war, uh, had been in charge of the Berlin airlift uh, in the 1940s. And so I think he he certainly trusted these men who uh, had a lot of experience uh, coming through World War II and in the Cold War period. And how did the Cuban Missile Crisis finally get resolved? And again, what what part did the press play in this? The period of time it takes for it to be resolved initially is the famous 13 days, the name of the book that Robert Kennedy wrote as a memoir about his experience, uh, and then a a movie that followed, uh, came out in the uh, early 2000s, uh, called 13 Days. It took that long to negotiate with the Soviets, night and day, using lots of back channels uh, to get them to agree uh, ultimately to remove those missiles from Cuba after the president had placed what he called a quarantine on any kind of offensive weaponry coming in from the Soviets by ship to Cuba. For that, he had to promise not to invade Cuba. So in that sense, the the Soviet ploy worked uh, for the Cubans, for Castro and his regime. As we know, he was never removed. Uh, And the president also secretly uh, had to agree to a quid pro quo of removing our missiles in Turkey uh, that were aimed at the Soviet Union. So it was definitely a a tit for tat. The United States had to make certain promises and give up certain uh, ideas and thoughts that we had in order to to make this deal. the press then uh, begins to press the president afterwards when the president has press conferences, which he did routinely on average twice a month. Uh, and so in November, he tells the press uh, where things are in this quid pro quo that, yes, the missiles will be removed. And ultimately, he gets to say to the press they are being removed. Uh, but the press really bears down on him in, in a November 20th press conference in 1962 to say, well, what about the uh, the moratoria? What about the secrecy that you imposed on us through the State Department, through the Defense Department. And the president uh, tries to use a little humor. He says, well, I'll talk to the people uh, at at State, and I'll I'll see if they can loosen things up a little bit. But he says, we have to keep the American people safe. We have to keep national security strong. And so there are going to be times when we have to ask you to keep things secret. And that's always a tension in our country between freedom of the press and presidents who sometimes for very good reasons reasons and sometimes for bad reasons, as in the case of Richard Nixon, who wanted to keep everything secret because he said it was a matter of national security. Historian Barbara Perry, Presidential Studies Director at the University of Virginia's Miller Center. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, as always. We begin on September 13, 1962, with a part of President Kennedy's news conference. He began with a statement on recent Soviet shipments of supplies and technicians into Cuba. There has been a great deal of talk on the situation in Cuba in recent days, both in the communist camp and in our own, and I would like to take this opportunity to set the matter in perspective. In the first place, it is Mr. Castro and his supporters who are in trouble. In the last year, his regime has been increasingly isolated from this hemisphere. His name no longer inspires the same fear or following 
in other Latin American countries. He has been condemned by the OAS, excluded from the Inter-American Defense Board, and kept out of the Free Trade Association. By his own monumental economic mismanagement, supplemented by our refusal to trade with him, his economy has crumbled, and his pledges for economic progress have been discarded along with his pledges for political freedom. His industries are stagnating. His harvests are declining. His own followers are beginning to see that their revolution has been betrayed. So it is not surprising that in a frantic effort to bolster his regime, he should try to arouse the Cuban people by charges of an imminent American invasion and commit himself still further to a Soviet takeover in the hope of preventing his own collapse. Ever since communism moved into Cuba in 1958, Soviet technical and military personnel have moved steadily onto the island in increasing numbers at the invitation of the Cuban government. Now that movement has been increased. It is under our most careful surveillance. But I will repeat the conclusion that I reported last week, that these new shipments do not constitute a serious threat to any other part of this hemisphere. If the United States ever should find it necessary to take military action against communism in Cuba, all of Castro's communist supplied weapons and technicians would not change the result or significantly extend the time required to achieve that result. However, unilateral military intervention on the part of the United States cannot currently be either required or justified. And it is regrettable that loose talk about such action in this country might serve to give a thin color of legitimacy to the communist pretense that such a threat exists. But let me make this clear once again. If at any time the communist buildup in Cuba were to endanger or interfere with our security in any way, including our base at Guantanamo, our passage to the Panama Canal, our missile and space activities at Cape Canaveral, or the lives of American citizens in this country, or if Cuba should ever attempt to export its aggressive purposes by force or the threat of force against any nation in this hemisphere, or become an offensive military base of significant capacity for the Soviet Union, then this country will do whatever must be done to protect its own security and that of its allies. We shall be alert to and fully capable of dealing swiftly with any such development. As President and Commander-in-Chief, I have full authority now to take such action. And I have asked the Congress to authorize me to call up reserve forces should this or any other crisis make it necessary. In the meantime, we intend to do everything within our power to prevent such a threat from coming into existence. Our friends in Latin America must realize the consequences such developments hold out for their own peace and freedom, and we shall be making further proposals to them. Our friends in NATO must realize the implications of their ships engaging in the Cuban trade. We shall continue to work with Cuban refugee leaders who are dedicated, as we are, to that nation's future return to freedom. We shall continue to keep the American people and the Congress fully informed. We shall increase our surveillance of the whole Caribbean area. We shall neither initiate nor permit aggression in this hemisphere. With this in mind, while I recognize that rash talk is cheap, particularly on the part of those who do not have the responsibility I would hope that the future record will show that the only people talking about a war or an invasion at this time are the communist spokesmen in Moscow and Havana, and that the American people, defending as we do so much of the free world, will in this nuclear age, as they have in the past, keep both their nerve and their head. President, coupling this statement with uh, the one of last week, at what point do you determine that the uh, build-up in Cuba has lost its defensive character and become offensive? Would it take an overt act? I think if you read last week's statement, the statement today, I've made it uh, quite clear. 
particularly in last week's statement when we talked about the presence of offensive military missile capacity or development of military base, other indications which I gave last week, all those would, of course, indicate a change in the nature of the threat. Well, Mr. President, in this same line, uh, do you have you set for yourself any uh, any rule or uh, set of conditions at which you will determine that the uh, existence of an offensive rather than a defensive force in Cuba? And in that same connection, in your reading of the Monroe Doctrine, what do you, how do you define intervention? Will it require force to contravene the Monroe Doctrine, or does the presence of a foreign power in any force, but not using that force in this hemisphere, amount to contravention of the doctrine? Well, I have uh, indicated that uh, if the uh, Cuba should possess a capacity to uh, carry out offensive actions against the United States, the United States uh, would act. I've also indicated that the United States would not permit Cuba to export its power by force in the hemisphere. The uh, United States will make uh, appropriate military judgments uh, after consultation with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and others, after carefully analyzing uh, whatever new information comes in as to whether that point has been reached where an offensive threat does exist. And at that time, uh, the country and the Congress uh, will be so notified. A few weeks later, President Kennedy called Secretary of State Dean Rusk to talk about Cuba's response to the U.S. demand that the missiles be removed. Cubans may want to resolve this by getting the weapons out in exchange for some sort of assurance about their uh, territorial integrity. Uh, We'll be working on the the idea here and the various forms in which such assurance might take. But uh, How does it come to you? How does this come Well, first, uh, Utah's first discussion with our people this morning. Yeah. And it looks as though the, uh, the threat of an invasion may be a quid pro, pro, quid pro quo for getting the missiles out. Yeah. Now, this would involve some uh, problems, but at least we were not intending to invade before the missiles got there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I just want to let... And then we also have something through the Canadians to the same effect. Yeah. So it's just possible that uh, this may uh, move faster than we had expected. Well, I think we'd have to do that because we weren't going to invade them anyway. That's right. All right, okay. On October 22nd, as tensions with the Soviet Union increased... The president spoke to the nation from the White House. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. Upon receiving the first preliminary hard information of this nature, last Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., I directed that our surveillance be stepped up. And having now confirmed and completed our evaluation of the evidence and our decision on a course of action, This government feels obliged to report this new crisis to you in fullest detail. The characteristic of these new missile sites indicate two distinct types of installations. Several of them include medium-range ballistic missiles capable of carrying a nuclear warhead for a distance of more than 1,000 nautical miles. Each of these missiles, in short, is capable of striking Washington, D.C., the Panama Canal, Cape Canaveral, Mexico City, or any other city in the southeastern part of the United States, in Central America, or in the Caribbean area. Additional sites not yet completed appear to be designed for intermediate-range ballistic missiles capable of traveling more than twice as far and thus capable of striking most of the major cities in the Western Hemisphere ranging as far north as Hudson's Bay, Canada, and as far south as Lima, Peru. In addition, jet bombers capable of carrying nuclear weapons are now being uncrated and assembled in Cuba while the necessary air bases are being prepared. This urgent transformation of Cuba into an important strategic base by the presence of these large, long-range, and clearly offensive weapons of sudden mass destruction 
constitutes an explicit threat to the peace and security of all the Americas in flagrant and deliberate defiance of the Rio Pact of 1947, the traditions of this nation and hemisphere, the joint resolution of the 87th Congress, the Charter of the United Nations, and my own public warnings to the Soviets on September 4th and 13th. This action also contradicts the repeated assurances of Soviet spokesmen, both publicly and privately delivered, that the arms build up in Cuba would retain its original defensive character, and that the Soviet Union had no need or desire to station strategic missiles on the territory of any other nation. The size of this undertaking makes clear that it has been planned for some months. Yet only last month, month, after I had made clear the distinction between any introduction of ground-to-ground -ground missiles and the existence of defensive anti-aircraft missiles, the Soviet government publicly stated on September 11th that, and I quote, the armaments and military equipment sent to Cuba are designed exclusively for defensive purposes, unquote. That there is, and I quote the Soviet government, there is no need for the Soviet government to shift its weapons for a retaliatory blow to any other country, for instance, Cuba, unquote. And that, and I quote the government, the Soviet Union has so powerful rockets to carry these nuclear warheads that there is no need to search for sites for them beyond the boundaries of the Soviet Union, unquote. That statement was false. Only last Thursday, as evidence of this rapid offensive buildup was already in my hand, Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko told me in my office that he was instructed to make it clear once again, as he said his government had already done, that Soviet assistance to Cuba, and I quote, pursued solely the purpose of contributing to the defense capabilities of Cuba, unquote. That, and I quote him, training by Soviet specialists of Cuban nationals in handling defensive armaments was by no means offensive. And that if it were otherwise, Mr. Gromyko went on, the Soviet government would never become involved in rendering such assistance, unquote. That statement also was false. President Kennedy's address to the nation about Soviet missiles in Cuba on October 22, 1962. Neither the United States of America nor the world community of nations can tolerate deliberate deception and offensive threats on the part of any nation, large or small. We no longer live in a world where only the actual firing of weapons represents a sufficient challenge to a nation's security to constitute maximum peril. Nuclear weapons are so destructive and ballistic missiles are so swift that any substantially increased possibility of their use or any sudden change in their deployment may well be regarded as a definite threat to peace. For many years, both the Soviet Union and the United States, recognizing this fact, have deployed strategic nuclear weapons with great care never upsetting the precarious status quo, which ensured that these weapons would not be used in the absence of some vital challenge. Our own strategic missiles have never been transferred to the territory of any other nation under a cloak of secrecy and deception. And our history, unlike that of the Soviets since the end of World War II, demonstrates that we have no desire to dominate or conquer any other nation or impose our system upon its people. Nevertheless, American citizens have become adjusted to living daily on the bullseye of Soviet missiles located inside the USSR or in submarines. In that sense, missiles in Cuba add to an already clear and present danger. Although it should be noted, the nations of Latin America had never previously been subjected to a potential nuclear threat. But this secret, swift, extraordinary buildup of communist missiles in an area well known to have a special and historical relationship to the United States and the nations of the Western Hemisphere, in violation of Soviet assurances and in defiance of American and hemispheric policy, this sudden, clandestine decision 
to station strategic weapons for the first time outside of Soviet soil is a deliberately provocative and unjustified change in the status quo, which cannot be accepted by this country if our courage and our commitments are ever to be trusted again by either friend or foe. The 1930s taught us a clear lesson. Aggressive conduct, if allowed to go unchecked and unchallenged, ultimately leads to war. This nation is opposed to war. We are also true to our word. Our unswerving objective, therefore, must be to prevent the use of these missiles against this or any other country and to secure their withdrawal or elimination from the Western Hemisphere. Our policy has been one of patience and restraint, as befits a peaceful and powerful nation which leads a worldwide alliance. We have been determined not to be diverted from our central concerns by mere irritants and fanatics. But now further action is required, and it is underway, and these actions may only be the beginning. We will not prematurely or unnecessarily risk the course of worldwide nuclear war in which even the fruits of victory would be ashes in our mouth. But neither will we shrink from that risk at any time it must be faced. Acting, therefore, in the defense of our own security and of the entire Western Hemisphere and under the authority entrusted to me by the Constitution as endorsed by the Re resolution of the Congress, I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. First, to halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, where they're found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. This quarantine will be extended, if needed, to other types of cargo and carriers. We are not at this time, however, denying the necessities of life, as the Soviets attempted to do in their Berlin blockade of 1948. Second, I have directed the continued and increased close surveillance of Cuba and its military buildup. The foreign ministers of the OAS, in their communique of October 6, rejected secrecy on such matters in this hemisphere. Should these offensive military preparations continue, thus increasing the threat to the hemisphere, further action will be justified. I have directed the armed forces to prepare for any eventualities, and I trust that in the interest of both the Cuban people and the Soviet technicians at the sites, the hazards to all concerned of continuing this threat will be recognized. Third, it shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Fourth, as a necessary military precaution, I have reinforced our base at Guantanamo, evacuated today the dependence of our personnel there, and ordered additional military units to be on a standby alert basis. Fifth, we are calling tonight for an immediate meeting of the Organization of Consultation under the Organization of American States to consider this threat to hemispheric security and to invoke Articles 6 and 8 of the Rio Treaty in support of all necessary action. The United Nations Charter allows for regional security arrangements and the nations of this hemisphere decided long ago against the military presence of outside powers. Our other allies around the world have also been alerted. JFK addressing the nation about Cuba on October 22, 1962. Under the charter of the United Nations, we are asking tonight that an emergency meeting of the Security Council be convoked without delay to take action against this latest Soviet threat to world peace. Our resolution will call for the prompt dismantling and withdrawal of all offensive weapons in Cuba under the supervision of UN observers before the quarantine can be lifted. Seventh and finally, I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to halt and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, 
and provocative threat to world peace and to stable relations between our two nations. I call upon him further to abandon this course of world domination and to join in an historic effort to end the perilous arms race and to transform the history of man. He has an opportunity now to move the world back from the abyss of destruction by returning to his government's own words that it had no need to station missiles outside its own territory and withdrawing these weapons from Cuba by refraining from any action which will widen or deepen the present crisis and then by participating in a search for peaceful and permanent solutions. This nation is prepared to present its case against the Soviet threat to peace and our own proposals for a peaceful world at any time and in any forum, in the OAS, in the United Nations, or in any other meeting that could be useful without limiting our freedom of action. We have in the past made strenuous efforts to limit the spread of nuclear weapons. We have proposed the elimination of all arms and military bases in a fair and effective disarmament treaty. We are prepared to discuss new proposals for the removal of tensions on both sides, including the possibilities of a genuinely independent Cuba, free to determine its own destiny. We have no wish to war with the Soviet Union, for we are a peaceful people who desire to live in peace with all other peoples. But it is difficult to settle or even discuss these problems in an atmosphere of intimidation. That is why this latest Soviet threat, or any other threat, which is made either independently or in response to our actions this week, must and will be met with determination. Any hostile move anywhere in the world against the safety and freedom of peoples to whom we are committed, including in particular the brave people of West Berlin, will be met by whatever action is needed. Finally, I want to say a few words to the captive people of Cuba, to whom this speech is being directly carried by special radio facilities. I speak to you as a friend, as one who knows of your deep attachment to your fatherland, as one who shares your aspirations for liberty and justice for all. And I have watched, and the American people have watched, with deep sorrow, how your nationalist revolution was betrayed and how your fatherland fell under foreign domination. Now your leaders are no longer Cuban leaders, inspired by Cuban ideals. They are puppets and agents of an international conspiracy which has turned Cuba against your friends and neighbors in the Americas and turned it into the first Latin American country to become a target for nuclear war. The first Latin American country to have these weapons on its soil. These new weapons are not in your interest. They contribute nothing to your peace and well-being. They can only undermine it. But this country has no wish to cause you to suffer or to impose any system upon you. We know that your lives and land are being used as pawns by those who deny your freedom. Many times in the past, the Cuban people have risen to throw out tyrants who destroyed their liberty. And I have no doubt that most Cubans today look forward to the time when they will be truly free, free from foreign domination, free to choose their own leaders, free to select their own system, free to own their own land, free to speak and write and worship without fear or degradation. And then shall Cuba be welcomed back to the society of free nations and to the associations of this hemisphere. My fellow citizens, let no one doubt that this is a difficult and dangerous effort on which we have set out. No one can foresee precisely what course it will take or what course or casualties will be incurred. Many months of sacrifice and self-discipline lie ahead, months in which both our patience and our will will be tested, months in which many threats and denunciations will keep us aware of our dangers. But the greatest danger of all would be to do nothing. The path we have chosen for the present is full of hazards, as all paths are. But it is the one most consistent with our character and courage as a nation and our commitments around the world. The cost of freedom is always high, but Americans have always paid it. 
And one path we shall never choose, and that is the path of surrender or submission. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere. And we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. Thank you and good night. The next day, President Kennedy called Army General Lucius Clay, who was a senior member of the organization of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The president began by reading a message from Khrushchev about U.S. actions over the situation in Cuba. Your speech of October 22nd regarding Cuba, I should say frankly that measures outlined in your statement represent serious threat to peace and security of people. The United States has openly taken the path of gross violation of charter of the United Nations, the path of violation of international norms of freedom of navigation on high seas, the path of aggressive actions both against Cuba and against the Soviet Union. The statement of the government of the United States of America cannot be evaluated in any other way than as naked interference in the domestic affairs of the Cuban Republic, the Soviet Union, and other states. The Charter of United Nations and international norms do not give right to any state whatsoever to establish in international waters controls of vessels bound for the shores of the Cuban Republic. It is self-understood that we also cannot recognize the right of the United States to establish control or armaments essential to the Republic of Cuba, the strengthening of its defensive capacity. We confirm that armaments now in Cuba, regardless of classification in which they belong, are destined exclusively for defensive purposes in order to secure the Cuban Republic from attack of aggressor. I hope the government of the United States will show prudence and renounce action, renounce action pursued by you, which could lead to, to catastrophic consequences for peace throughout the world. The viewpoint of the Soviet government with regard to your statement of October 22nd is set forth in the statement of the Soviet government, which is being conveyed to you through your ambassador in Moscow, signed Khrushchev. So uh, I suppose, uh, uh, General, we can anticipate difficulties in Berlin as well as other places, and I thought that uh, we would keep you informed that perhaps uh, as the situation became uh, more intense there that uh, you might be willing to come down later in the week. I'm available at any time for anything, Mr. President. Good, fine. Do you have more than anything else? So at any time and anything that I'm called on and can do, I'm available and at your service. Fine. Well, if you get any uh, also uh, thoughts on any of these matters, uh, I hope you uh, call me. Uh, General Taylor or uh, me, because uh, as I said, it seems to me Berlin is a key problem, as it has been from the beginning in this whole uh, matter. But I'll be in touch with you later in the week as we get the uh, situation involved in Berlin. Yes, sir. Good. Thanks, General. Right. Right later that day, the President talked with Deputy Defense Secretary Roswell Gilpatrick. Uh, as I understood, there's some report that the Russian ships were not going to stop, that we were going to have to sink them. Uh, or in order to stop them, uh, I thought that uh, we, or we were going to have to fire on them. I was wondering whether the instructions on how that's to be done or where they're to be shot at and so on to cause the minimum of damage. And in addition, if they're boarded, it's very possible the Russians will fire at them as they board and we'd have to fire back and have quite a slaughter. I would think we'd want two or three things. First, I think we'd want to have some control over cameras aboard these boats so that we don't have a lot of people shooting a lot of pictures, which in the press might be... Yeah, with our control, all the picture taken. Oh, yeah, on the boats? Yeah. They all turn their cameras. Secondly, I don't know enough about the ships, but where they ought to fire and whether they ought to go through three or four steps, such as asking them to stop. They don't stop asking them to have their crew come above deck so that they don't be damaged, and three, so that we have this record made. Maybe yes, you can talk to somebody about it. Yes, that. we've got a instructions to sink land, which, which start with those steps, shot across the bow, shot through the rudder. Uh, shot through the rudder. Oh, oh, then a boarding party, and then the order the crews to come on deck, and the minimum amount of force at each stage. Now, right. hey, we haven't thought of everything, but we'll, we'll take a okay, look at Okay, fine. How did those uh, photographic expeditions go this morning, you know? No instant. They're, they're, they were back a couple right. hours ago. We'll see the pictures uh, later. I see. You're getting that one from me, aren't you, those Florida bases? That's right. Okay. Have you taken a look at West Palm Beach? Yeah, the Air Force is doing that. We can look at all of the dispersal right. possibilities down there. Okay, good. Do you, you, you cite anything about Nelson Rockefeller, or are you going to leave that? Wait a minute now. What about the... Uh, uh, he sent him a telegram saying that uh, I'd be in touch with him later. I thought we'd meet at 6, but what my thought was that we'd bring down the Civil Defense Committee. If we bring down yeah. every governor, then it seems to me we're kind of in the obligation to bring every congressman down to brief. No, he just wanted to have the Civil Defense Committee. Well, then I, that's what we'll be in touch with him about, right. I, I, because uh, I'm hoping Pittman and uh, Ed McDermott will come today anyway. Then we'll send a wire from them to uh, him and arrange that meeting. Do it, right? Yeah. All right. Okay, right. 
Three days later, the president spoke with State Department spokesman Lincoln White. That's the sort of stuff that's got to come from me and the White House. Christ, we're meeting every morning on this to control this, the escalation. I don't want to just be... The fact that you refer back to my speech, that then gives them a lead headline saying the United States is planning further action. And we had a long talk about it this morning, and it was agreed that the talk about the statement on the build-up would come from the White House, and that we wouldn't say anything about what action we're going to take. And we don't want to... When you make a reference back to my speech, it then gives them a lead that further action is going to be taken. Uh, We've got to get this under control, I think, because it's too important. I want it to be run out of the White House. Yeah. Under me, to Salinger, to you people, and to Sylvester. Yeah. And nothing dealing with the Cuban crisis of any importance is to go out until it goes through Salinger and comes to me. Because uh, I'm not, uh, I don't want to be critical, but the, the problem is when you say further action is going to be taken, then they all say what action? And it moves this escalation up a couple of days when we're not ready for it. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. So therefore, you have to be goddamn careful. You just can't make references to past speeches because that gives them a new headline, and they've got now got it. And every reporter in town is going to be putting together Pierre Salinger's release about the uh, missile thing with your thing that further action, and we're going to find ourselves getting out of control. Two days later, on October 28th, the president called his predecessor, Dwight Eisenhower. The two talked about how to deal with Khrushchev. General, I just wanted to bring you up to date on this uh, matter because I know of your concern about it. We got, uh, Friday night, got a message from uh, Khrushchev, which uh, said that uh, he would uh, withdraw these missiles and technicians and so on, providing we did not plan to invade Cuba. We uh, then got a message, uh, that public one, the next morning, in which he said he would do that if we withdrew our missiles from Turkey. We uh, then, as you know, uh, issued a statement that uh, we couldn't, get into that deal. So uh, we then got this message this morning. So we now uh, have to wait to see how it unfolds, and there's a good deal of complexities to it. Uh, if the, uh, the withdrawal of these missiles, technicians, and the cessation of uh, subversive activity by them, well, we just have to set up satisfactory procedures to determine whether these actions will be carried out. So I would think that uh, if we can do that, we'll be uh, find our interests advanced, even though it may be only one more chapter in a rather long story as far as Cuba is concerned. The standoff ended when the U.S. and Soviet Union publicly agreed to a deal in which the USSR would dismantle the missile sites in exchange for a U.S. pledge not to invade Cuba. In a separate deal, which remained secret for more than 25 years, the U.S. also agreed to remove its nuclear missiles from Turkey. President Kennedy spoke to the nation about the agreement on November 2nd. My fellow citizens, I want to take this opportunity to report on the conclusions which this government has reached on the basis of yesterday's aerial photographs, which will be made available tomorrow, as well as other indications, namely that the Soviet missile bases in Cuba are being dismantled, their missiles and related equipment are being crated, and the fixed installations at these sites are being destroyed. The United States intends to follow closely the completion of this work through a variety of means, including aerial surveillance, until such time as a equally satisfactory international means of verification is effective. While the quarantine remains in effect, we are hopeful that adequate procedures can be developed for international inspection of Cuba-bound cargoes. The International Committee of the Red Cross, in our view, would be an appropriate agent in this matter. The continuation of these measures in air and sea until the threat to peace posed by these offensive weapons is gone is in keeping with our pledge to secure their withdrawal or elimination from this hemisphere. It is in keeping with the resolution of the OAS And it is in keeping with the exchange of letters with Chairman Khrushchev of October 27th and 28th. Progress is now being made towards the restoration of peace in the Caribbean. And it is our firm hope and purpose that this progress shall go forward. We will continue to keep the American people informed on this vital matter. Two weeks later, he held a news conference at the White House. Here's part of his opening statement. 
I have uh, today been informed by Chairman Khrushchev that all of the IL-28 bombers now in Cuba will be withdrawn in 30 days. He also agrees that these planes can be observed and counted as they leave. Inasmuch as this goes a long way towards reducing the danger which faced this hemisphere four weeks ago, I have this afternoon instructed the Secretary of Defense to lift our naval quarantine. In view of this action, I want to take this opportunity to bring the American people up to date on the Cuban crisis and to review the progress made thus far in fulfilling the understandings between Soviet Chairman Khrushchev and myself as set forth in our letters of October 27th and 28th. Chairman Khrushchev, it will be recalled, agreed to remove from Cuba all weapons systems capable of offensive use to halt the further introduction of such weapons into Cuba and to permit appropriate United Nations observation and supervision to ensure the carrying out and continuation of these commitments. We on our part agree that once these adequate arrangements for verification had been established, we would remove our naval quarantine and give assurances against the invasion of Cuba. The evidence to date indicates that all known offensive missile sites in Cuba have been dismantled. The missiles and their associated equipment have been loaded on Soviet ships. And our inspection at sea of these departing ships has confirmed that the number of missiles reported by the Soviet Union as having been brought into Cuba, which closely corresponded to our own information, has now been removed. In addition, the Soviet government has stated that all nuclear weapons have been withdrawn from Cuba and no offensive weapons will be reintroduced. Nevertheless, important parts of the understanding of October 27th and 28th remain to be carried out. The Cuban government has not yet permitted the United Nations to verify whether all offensive weapons have been removed, and no lasting safeguards have yet been established against the future introduction of offensive weapons back into Cuba. Consequently, if the Western Hemisphere is to continue to be protected against offensive weapons, this government has no choice but to pursue its own means of checking on military activities in Cuba. The importance of our continued vigilance is underlined by our identification in recent days of a number of Soviet ground combat units in Cuba. Although we are informed that these and other Soviet units were associated with the protection of offensive weapon systems and will also be withdrawn in due course, I repeat, we would like nothing better than adequate international arrangements for the task of inspection and verification in Cuba. And we are prepared to continue our efforts to achieve such arrangements. Until that is done, difficult problems remain. As for our part, if all offensive weapon systems are removed from Cuba and kept out of the hemisphere in the future, under adequate verification and safeguards, and if Cuba is not used for the export of aggressive communist purposes, there will be peace in the Caribbean. And as I said in September, quote, we shall neither initiate nor permit aggression in this hemisphere. We will not, of course, abandon the political, economic, and other efforts of this hemisphere to halt subversion from Cuba, nor our purpose and hope that the Cuban people shall someday be truly free. But these policies are very different from any intent to launch a military invasion of the island. In short, the record of recent weeks shows real progress, and we are hopeful that further progress can be made. The completion of the commitment on both sides and the achievement of a peaceful solution to the Cuban crisis might well open the door to the solution of other outstanding problems. May I add this final thought? In this week of Thanksgiving, there is much for which we can be grateful. As we look back to where we stood only four weeks ago, the unity of this hemisphere, the support of our allies, and the calm determination of the American people, these qualities may be tested many more times in this decade. But we have increased reason to be confident that those qualities will continue to serve the cause of freedom with distinction in the years to come. And now, questions on Cuba. President, uh, with respect to your no-invasion pledge, uh, there has been considerable discussion and speculation in the press 
as to the exact scope of this pledge. I believe that uh, Chairman Khrushchev in his letter of the 28th uh, made the assumption or the implication or the statement that uh, no attack would be made on Castro, not only by the United States, but any other country in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, it appeared to be an implication that possibly you would be willing to guarantee Castro against any and all enemies anywhere. Now, I realize that in your letter there was nothing of that sort, and you've touched on this today, but I'm, I'm wondering if you could be a bit more specific on the scope of your no-invasion pledge. I think that today's statement is, uh, describes uh, very uh, clearly what the policy is of the government in regard to no-invasion. Uh, I think if you reread the statement, you will see that uh, the position of the government on that matter. Mr. President, in uh, speaking of uh, adequate uh, verification, does this mean that uh, we insist upon on-site inspection? Would we be satisfied with anything less than, than actual on-the-spot inspection in Cuba? Well, we have uh, thought that uh, to provide uh, adequate inspection, it should be on-site. As you know, Mr. Castro has not agreed to that, so we have had to use... Uh, our own resources to implement the decision of the organization American states that uh, the uh, hemisphere should continue to keep itself informed about the development of uh, weapon systems in Cuba. Yes. Mr. President, uh, apparently you've established quite a free-flowing channel of communication with uh, Chairman Khrushchev. I wonder if you could comment uh, any on this, perhaps telling us how many messages you've exchanged, uh, some of the tenor of those, and if this will be a, a pattern for the future. Now, we've exchanged uh, s several messages in an attempt to try to uh, work out uh, the details of the withdrawal of the IL-28 and also a system of verification in an attempt to uh, fill in in detail the assurances given in uh, the letters of uh, late October. So that's uh, what the correspondence has uh, been about. I think that's been very uh, clearly stated. And as I say today, a message was received uh, several hours ago indicating that the IL-28 would be uh, taken out. The main uh, burden of the negotiation, however, has been borne uh, by uh, Mr. McCloy and Governor Stevenson in their conversations. But I have uh, continued to indicate uh, how we defined offensive weapons which has been the subject of, these, of this correspondence and really the subject of the negotiations between Mr. Uh, McCloy and Mr. Stevenson on the one hand, Mr. Knut, so, uh, the Russians on the other. In addition, the question of adequate verification has been a subject of uh, the correspondence and the subject of the negotiation. Six days later, the president visited two military bases. His first stop, Fort Stewart, Georgia. General Haynes and men of the 1st Armored Division I want to express on behalf of the people of the United States our great appreciation to you for your past service and most especially your present actions during the difficult period of the last four or five weeks. Regardless of how uh, persistent our diplomacy may be, in activities that are stretching all around the globe. In the final analysis, it rests upon the power of the United States. And that uh, power rests upon the will and courage of our citizens and upon uh, you here in this field. The United States is the guarantor of the independence of dozens of countries that are stretching around the world. And the reason that we are able to guarantee the freedom of those countries and to maintain that guarantee and make it good is because of you and your comrades in arms on a dozen different uh, forts and posts, on ships at sea, planes in the air. All of you, uh, and there are a million of your comrades in uniform outside of the United States who are also part of the keystone of the arch of freedom throughout the globe. So I come here today to express our thanks to you. The cause of freedom and your work are intimately intertwined. The danger is certainly not past, but we will continue to live in crisis and danger certainly through this decade. And therefore, we will continue to call upon your services in the future as we have during the past days. 
I want to express our thanks to you. Many years ago, according to the story, there was found in a sentry box in Gibraltar a poem which said, God and the soldier, all men adore, in time of danger and not before. When the danger's passed and all things righted, God is forgotten and the old soldier slighted. This country does not forget God or the soldier. Upon both, we now depend. Thank you. Later that day, he spoke at Homestead Air Force Base in Florida. I want to express our great appreciation to you on behalf of the people of the United States, to all of you who have taken part in the activities which have uh, made it possible for the United States to defend its security in very difficult times. I may say, uh, gentlemen, that you take excellent pictures, and I've seen a good many of them. And beginning uh, with the uh, photographs which were taken on the weekend in uh, the middle of October, which first gave us conclusive proof of the buildup of offensive weapons in Cuba through the days that have followed to the present time, the work of these uh, two units have contributed as much to the security of the United States as any units in our history and any group of men in our history. The, uh, we are an open society, and uh, all that we have is, uh, in a sense, available to the world. We are in a struggle, though we do not uh, wish it, uh, we accept it, with a closed system. And therefore, the ability to detect those developments which directly threaten our security or those nations associated with us this ability is essential to our survival, to the uh, maintenance of our security and vital interests, and in a very real sense, to the maintenance of peace. So I think that uh, you gentlemen can take every satisfaction in uh, what you are doing, what you have done, and in what you will do. We are very much indebted to you. And we are particularly uh, indebted to Major Anderson, who is a member of one of these wings, who's a uh, was the only casualty of the last few weeks, but who is uh, symbolic, I think, of the willingness of a good many Americans to uh, take uh, great hazards uh, on behalf of their country. We're very much indebted to you all. Seven days later, the president held an event in the White House Rose Garden for radio executives and reporters. Mr. Morrow, Governor, Mr. Minow, I want to express our thanks to the radio stations who were so helpful and uh, contributed such an important national service to us during the difficult days that have just passed. We were extremely anxious to get across our point of view, which was the point of view of the free people of this hemisphere, to the people of Cuba in late October and early November. We therefore asked a number of radio stations if they could assist us. The Voice of America broadcast to Latin America and to Cuba through short wave. We were anxious that medium wave be used, and the only device that we could uh, use was the uh, radio stations. We went to all of them. They immediately volunteered their assistance. Uh, none of them uh, put forward all of the objections which they could have in regard to previous programs and previous commitments, but instead immediately made their stations available, and from uh, dusk till dawn, they broadcast the message of the United States to the people of Cuba. We're very grateful to them. I think they showed uh, two things. First, how significant radio is in getting across a message beyond uh, national boundaries. And secondly, they showed how patriotic were those uh, men who uh, ran these stations. The Cuban Missile Crisis had been resolved. But the Cold War continued to ramp up. Six months later, on June 10, 1963, President Kennedy gave one of his most memorable speeches. He talked about peace, not just securing it, but promoting it. In short, both the United States and its allies and the Soviet Union and its allies have a mutually deep interest in a just and genuine peace 
and in holding the arms race. Agreements to this end are in the interests of the Soviet Union as well as ours. And even the most hostile nations can be relied upon to accept and keep those treaty obligations and only those treaty obligations which are in their own interest. So let us not be blind to our differences, but let us also direct attention to our common interests and the means by which those differences can be resolved. And if we cannot end now our differences, at least we can help make the world safe for diversity. For in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit this small planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's futures. And we are all mortal. Our thanks to the JFK Library for the information and audio. And if you liked this podcast, please rate and review. Interested in more of C-SPAN's history programming? Check out our other podcasts, including The Weekly, Lectures in History, and Landmark Cases, available wherever you found this podcast.